Okay, let's just start. Um, I've got a lot of information I want to share with you. First of all, a couple housekeeping um, issues. Uh, this is a Zoom meeting, not a Zoom presentation. So um, your mics can be on or your video can be on, but they can also be off. Um, if you have a question, um, you'll need to turn your mic on. Um, just know that this will be recorded. Um, so if you don't want you to be heard or to be seen, make sure your mics and video are off. Uh, it's a 45 minute presentation with uh, 10 minutes for questions afterwards. Um, I have several links, lots of resources. Um, there is a slide that has potentially sensitive information on it. Um, and it's, it's around uh, diversity, equity, uh, the varsity blues scandal. So um, if you have any uh, questions or want to talk more about these issues, I'm always available after the talk to meet with you. Um, the title of the presentation, I think, is something like creating a genuine application. Uh, but really, the title should be more like how to step to the dance of changing college admissions. Uh, my name is Patrick Tassoni. I've been in uh, the college. Uh, world, college admissions world for about 20 years. Um, I love the admissions world. Um, I love visiting colleges and universities all around the world and meeting the people who inhabit those spaces. Everybody is uh, usually seems so positive. Working with young adults in, in this uh, process is, uh, is uh, fulfilling to me. Um, and uh, also researching topics uh, like the ones I'm going to talk about is, is interesting. Oops, again. Okay, so I'm going to start off with uh, reviewing the, um, let me see if I can get rid of that. Yeah, the mission and the core values of ASD. Um, I think it correlates well with the topic we're going to discuss. Um, as we uh, challenge and inspire each student to achieve their dreams and to become passionate learners prepared to adapt and contribute to a rapidly changing world. And I would say that the landscape of college admissions is rapidly changing. Um, and we're going to cover that. Uh, what I want and hope that uh, you take away from this is how you can adapt to this rapidly changing world uh, within the context of college admissions. And of course, always the core values of compassion, excellence, integrity, respect, and responsibility fit very well with the approach that we're using in college admissions uh, these days. Um, so, um, to sort of dive into it, there's been three big events that have shifted the landscape of college admissions. Um, and the, the first one we're gonna talk about is Black Lives Matter. Um, this uh, started on social media. It happened, it started back in 2016. And since then, there have been some events, actually some murders of African-Americans that have inspired this movement and added to it. Uh, this movement has also uh, sort of um, highlighted diversity, equity, and inclusion, especially in on college campuses and in college admissions. Um, I'm gonna try something. Uh, this talk has a lot of um, attachments. And so I'll be going back and forth from the presentation to the attachment. Um, and hopefully this will work. So the Kaplan survey that, that recently came out said that nearly 30% of colleges say that Black Lives Matter movement has challenged their admissions process um, directly in terms of admissions and who they're admission, admitting um, in terms of underrepresented students, of course, but also um, it's, it's challenged their thinking around the other students they're admitting. And colleges and universities, um, at least the reps that, that visit our school have all said about the same thing, that, that this was important 
years ago, but it's highlighted today because of this movement. And colleges and universities want students on their campus who can have these critical conversations around race, diversity, equity in the classroom and outside of the classroom. So um, what does that mean for college admissions? What does that mean for our students? It means that the applications, uh, you know, they're gonna be looking for students who are able to have these conversations. Uh, of course, you've all heard about this, uh, the Varsity Blues scandal. This is the uh, fraud and bribery, the folks who sort of crossed the line um, in terms of influence um, in order to get their students, uh, children and students accepted to, uh, into selective colleges and universities. There was a Netflix uh, movie about it. Um, and this has uh, affected the way colleges and universities uh, view applicants. Um, some people say not enough. Uh, some people say that it's just the, you know, the du jour uh, thing of the day, um, but uh, we'll talk more about this and, and how this affects admissions later on in this talk. And of course, you know, the COVID pandemic, this has also affected college admissions, everybody, uh, and I'm going to let you hear a, a report from NPR that sort of highlights uh, how the COVID pandemic has affected admissions, and I'll just hope, hopefully this works. University of Southern California is among those suddenly retooling systems that have looked basically the same for decades. It's especially complicated, she says, since different students might have different holes in their applications. We've asked students to give us what they might have available to them. So, you know, we may not normally use AP scores or, you know, writing samples, but we've told the students, give us what you think best represents you in an academic space and let us see what we can do with that. By most accounts, students' recommendations and their essays will get a closer read this year, though pro tip, schools say do think twice before submitting 650 words on how you spent your COVID staycation. As Tulane University's admissions director, Jeff Schiffman cautions, COVID fatigue is real. I'll use myself as an example. I've had to cancel my wedding four times. So, you know, everyone is everyone's going through something. And I don't think folks are going to want to have to relive it over and over and over again with 45,000 applications. But understanding that the pandemic has been a truly extenuating circumstance for many students, Schiffman and others will be paying close attention to a new short question added this year to the common application on how the pandemic has impacted each student. Some, like Tulane, are also adding a new interview option, by Zoom of course, hoping to fill in for the face-to-face -face encounters that used to happen at college fairs and recruiting trips to schools. Others are leaning on more innovative options options. To answer your question, I would have fun. Go to the park. Bowdoin uh, College well, recently well, rolled out an app that spits out random questions like, what would you do if you had no internet or phone for the afternoon? Applicants get 30 seconds to think and two minutes to answer as the app records like it did for Khalil Jackson. So without the internet, I would be forced to make those connections with other people. And I'd honestly be happy to do that. Bowdoin's Dean of Admissions, Whitney Sewell, says the unpracticed, unpolished view of students says a lot. Just the mere fact that a student's willing to do it is impressive, right? I mean, that in itself says something important about the student. As one school that was already test optional, Bowdoin is among those ahead of schools going cold turkey this year. I just got off a Zoom with most of my admission directors, and they're all looking a little green at the prospect of what's before them. Cornell's admissions dean, Jonathan Burdick, says the admissions team will undergo months of retraining. One change this year may be to put more focus on students' character. The so-called character movement has been growing for a while, but the pandemic is fueling interest among many, including Temple University's admissions head, Sean Abbott. We're thinking about how we might extract characteristics that we would value at Temple, something perhaps like citizenship or social justice or tenacity. But I think probably every college university in America right now is having that kind of soul searching conversation so welcome to this important conversation related to how do we evaluate personal qualities as we move forward into this uh, uncharted territory. 
This spring at the annual conference of the Common Application, CEO Jenny Ricard scrapped the planned agenda and instead invited Angela Duckworth, famous for her work on grit and other so-called character or non-cognitive skills. Whatever you... Okay, so um, I invite you to listen to that NPR report. Um, the reason I brought up Black Lives Matter and diversity, equity, inclusion, varsity blues, the, the scandal and the COVID pandemic is because it influences the landscape of college admissions as you heard from that report. Um, we've been saying this for a long time. Uh, college and universities are shifting from an achievement based uh, admissions practice to a more learner oriented character based um, application. However, uh, we also know that the, you know, it's a slow move. Uh, some people have shifted. Um, and I mean, the question we need to ask is, well, how have they shifted? You know, what's different on the common application? You know, what in the parts of the application have changed? And, you know, I would say the way they read it, as well as maybe some of the supplement questions and what they're looking for in the pieces they're asking of students. See if I can. Okay, so retooling college admissions. So, how has college admissions been retooled um, based on uh, the uh, the things that have happened recently? So, test optional. Many of you have already heard this. This was a thing before the college scandal. This was a thing before COVID. Many college and universities were going test optional. Uh, the pandemic was the catalyst to moving more colleges and universities into that space. Um, there's been a more rigorous analysis of content on, in the applications. And that's directly from Varsity Blues that more colleges and universities are doing looking further into what students are saying that they did uh, in terms of their achievements and talents, but also does it all make sense? Uh, the admissions folks are very savvy at reading the uh, applications. You know, if a student is uh, putting down their list of activities and then says that they did X, Y, and Z, and that the classes that they chose didn't even co didn't correlate with the thing that they're doing, and their recs don't support the achievements or whatever, that colleges and universities are looking a little bit uh, more at that. Um, we have uh, we had a, over 100 college and universities visit uh, virtually. Some some came to the the campus this year, um, and we've been asking our reps, how has the varsity blues, how has uh, COVID, how has uh, Black Lives Matter affected uh, admissions? And this um, is the feedback they've been giving us. Um, college and universities are monitoring do donations closer and some are actually getting rid of legacy influence. Um, as you heard from the NPR um, presentation, essays and the letters of rec are getting a closer look. So if you don't have tests, they still need to use the data points. They still need data points to make the decision. With that said, <laughs> Um, there's been an increase in applications. Harvard University had 57,000 applicants last year for 1,700 spots, which is about a 4.8% admit rate. At some point, those kids who are admitted are going to look just like 10 other students. So at some point, this is more of a lottery uh, than it is, um, you know, a science of uh, admissions, um, okay? And why did they have an increase of applications? Well, because they were test optional. So no longer did someone see um, an average test score and say, well, I don't have a chance. Why would I even, why would I try? And that is a good thing. And it's also, you know, sort of upended admissions in terms of the numbers. Um, it's affected uh, what we, the, the way the application is read. We're, we're, we're moving into more of a, a character. We're looking at character, citizenship, social justice, tenacity, and grit. Um, 
as qualities for admission. And that comes through the application in different ways. Um, we're also you know, evaluating personal qualities and, and they're just beginning to tap, tap this, um, um, coming up with different measures and so forth. Okay, so that's how colleges might be retooling their admissions. Speaking of that, um, there have been two really wonderful, well, more than two, but there is this uh, group out of Harvard calling, calling um, Turning the Tide, Making Caring Common. And it is a think tank. It is supported by most colleges and universities in the United States. And it is really a, a response to the college craziness, the college frenzy, the, uh, the unhealthy practices that sort of led to this varsity blue scandal that we talked about. Um, and I'm just gonna click on this. You won't be able to read all, the, all this right now, but if you are interested in college admissions and the way it's shifting, um, going from uh, an achievement-based process to now including character, definitely look at these papers. Um, there was a, a documentary just 10 years ago that came out um, called The Race to Nowhere. And it was created by documentary film mothers who were documentary film uh, makers. And they had enough and, and they created this movement that sort of said, we need to do something. This process is unhealthy. What can we do? And essentially, this is a blueprint, not only for... Um, uh, students and parents in high schools, but also for recommendations for admissions departments across the world, what they can do to um, take action. So they believe that students should be encouraged to engage in meaningful, sustained community service that is authentically chosen, consistent, and well-structured, and that provides opportunity for reflection both individually and with peers and adults. The college admissions process should value this kind of service. So essentially, there, it's a call to action for admissions departments to get real, to sort of say, listen, not everybody is going to have, uh, you know, an internship with the national, you know, with the, the cancer society at XYZ University. Um, students should be encouraged to take collective action that tackles community challenges. This could be local, it could be in your school, it could be within your grade level, it could be in your home. Um, students should be encouraged to have authentic, meaningful experiences with diversity that focus on doing with not doing for. The college admissions process should value these kinds of experiences. So um, that's something for us definitely to be sensitive in this part of the world. Students should encourage and engage in service that develops gratitude and a sense of responsibility for the future. The college admissions process should value this kind of service. Um, if you're interested in reading more about this, uh, I highly recommend um, reading this, we are definitely including this into our college program and very and, and sensitive to this also. So that's one read for you. And the other one uh, is essentially what parents in high schools can do to cultivate ethical character re and, dis and reduce the distress in the college admissions process. And what I want you to know is that, because I, I, I know some people are, are saying, well, you know, that's great, but how do I get into college X, Y, and Z? Um, college X, Y, and Z are also reading this. I mean, this came from College X, right? Um, and they are also sensitive to um, what's going on in terms of the shift and what their responsibility is in this shift to a more character-based assessment in admissions. Okay. So for parents, um, ethical parenting in the college admissions process, keep the focus on your team, follow your ethical GPS, 
especially in times of stress and pressure. Um, you know, I like to call, it, call, you know, parents to look at the infinite game, not the finite game, right? Um, <laughs> college is a, uh, a part of the infinite game. Um, it's not the end. Uh, use the admissions process as an opportunity for ethical education, be authentic, help your teen contribute to others in meaningful ways, advocate for elevating ethical character and reducing achievement related distress, right? Model and encourage gratitude. Okay. So let's move on here. So what can ASD students do? in this time of the landscape shift in uh, admissions? Well, we have a lot of great things already going on here. And I, I like to say, let's lean into the learner orientation as opposed to the achievement orientation. Because the achievement orientation, while there are definitely things we can do, and things that you're, you're, you're generally interested in, in terms of like the Johns Hopkins Center for Talent Deve Development or, or different programs that you can, you can purchase or join. Um, there's also a lot of untapped resources and things at ASD that you can lean into that give you that same bang for the buck, right? Um, consider if you are interested in research, um, applying, to the AP seminar or AP research uh, classes. You would apply to the AP seminar class. Um, we have something called ASD self-directed projects. Um, this is on the connect page. And uh, last year students worked with the, uh, the department and they created amazing, they had amazing ideas and created amazing projects that they researched, but were also a stepping stone to maybe something else that they wanted to do. It was the first way to get engagement that they could possibly scale up into other projects. And I'm just going to show you this right now because um, there's something called this. I use this as an example because the Fields Foundation is where I go to see where students are thriving in their learning orientation. And every year, Peter Thiel gives $100,000 to students to work on their ideas, to maybe forego college for a little bit and work on ideas that are near and dear to them. And, and I want you to look at this on your own time and they actually have the, the name of the students here and what they're doing. So, um, you know, these self-directed projects could turn into something like this, right? Where students are doing something genuine, something that's supported in school, something that uh, adults in the school would be able to verify, something that has a process to it, because it's not necessarily the end product, it's the process that students go through that colleges are interested in, in addition to the great things they do. And if, if, if you're doing it within the school and it's supported by the folks in the school, you'll have people who can also uh, validate that experience. Internships, uh, we have a thriving internship program here. If students are want to get experience or students want to uh, engage in real world experience via their interest, that is an option. There is something called the Summer Self-Directed Project. This is not at ASD, but I wanted to show you this because this is from the College Essay Guide, but there's something called the Uncommon Applicant. It's a video course um, that says, listen, if you have a cool idea or a project and you want to scale it up, or you want to engage in the process of developing your own uh, project, we have a solution for you. They're not doing it for you. They're giving you the vehicle for you to engage in the structure so you can stand, you know, so you can uh, uh, research and build a program 
that's interesting to you. Not everybody has to do this, but if you have an idea, this is a great resource for you, okay? We offer the Global Online Academy here with, uh, I don't know if you've had the opportunity to look at the classes that are offered here, but you know they're really wonderful ways for students to engage in topics that they might not be able to engage with at the school level. So it's leveling up. So you, let's say you took AP psychology. Well, you also have the opportunity to take abnormal psychology. And maybe that fits in with a self-directed project. Maybe that correlates to a summer project you're doing. Do you see where I'm going here? This is the, this learning orientation, um, not achievement-based orientation. We're not collecting awards and accolades. We're really getting, we're really interested in our learning. We're being curious and we're taking initiative to foster that learning. Um, learning opportunities outside of school. Okay, so it's also, you know, there's a lot of great programs out there for students in the United States as well as um, worldwide, like the TAS, the Telluride Association Summer Programs. Um, this is free. Uh, and this is something, it's a process-oriented think tank, essentially, for students who are curious about topics. Uh, uh, you can read here what topics they're interested in, and um, you need to apply to these types of programs. But these are great programs. You're not paying for it, um, and it's an experiential program. So. This is a little controversial, but um, this, I don't like the name of this, but this book is really helpful if you're looking to um, scale up uh, or engage in activities outside of the classroom, right? And um, you could start as early as the seventh grade on this. Um, The, what I like about this is it, it, it begs a question that a lot of parents have are when I show this slide, like learning opportunities outside of school, it's like, how do we know about these opportunities? I like this book because um, this is where you're gonna find those opportunities. Now, um, and, and it divides it up into what you're interested in. So if you're interested in journalism, um, they will give you ideas on how to scale up your engagement around journalism, okay? And of course I showed you the Theo Fellows. Lots of resources, I told you I was gonna get a, show you a lot of things here. So the other thing that students can do is develop leadership and an entre entrepreneurial spirit. You hear a lot about this these days. This is, you know, this is the Google way. This is, this is where the world of work is going, whether it's social entrepreneurial or business entrepreneurial, they're looking for people who can scale up an idea, who can get other people involved, who can share their idea with other people, who can try something, fail at something, get back up and do something else. So, um, you know, what, it could be creating a program for younger students at ASD, and we have several of those. You could revive a club that was diminished during COVID. A lot of kids said, well, I can't do it. <laughs> you know, we can't meet in person. Well, you can, you can use Zoom, you can do Google Meets, you can get underclassmen involved in what you're interested in, in order to move the dial in a positive direction. You hear a lot about community. So how do we increase access to resources for others in the community? And I hear a lot of this, well, we're in Dubai, we can't do it because you know we, we don't have the independence. There's a lot of opportunities here. Um, some of my students have helped out uh, with the victims of the Beirut bombing. Um, they've, uh, we've got students who have created programs around the Syrian crisis and engaging with people all over the world um, 
about with with refugees who are in other places in the world. We have a lot of students who are interested in diversity, equity, inclusion, and they've created clubs and programs. Um, and in human rights, there's there's we have a lot of students who are socially engaged and doing things around these topics that sort of speak to that slide around diversity, equity, inclusion, the things that colleges and universities are looking for in young people these days. And I just wanna draw your attention to all of the great things that are happening here at ASD and the spaces that kids, students can be engaged and potentially move the dial um, around what they're generally interested in and um, having impact in the, in the community and an experience. And there's, you know, some of these are directly related to what I was just talking about. There's a, there's a program where students, E for E, uh, where students are strengthening relationships and building community. So there's service learning, sustainability, and global leadership. We have these groups here at ASD and students can be involved uh, with these structured groups at ASD. Yeah, okay. So what do students need to be sensitive to from ASD when articulating their background and their experiences, when they wanna show perspective, when they wanna show who am I in addition to fabulous grades in selective courses um, with a list of activities. So in addition to that, um, I'm just gonna sort of read at you right now. Um, we are asking students to write with awareness. So, so I, read, I read an application by a young woman growing up uh, on a Native Amer American reservation in poverty, surrounded by family members who abuse alcohol and other drugs. She faced serious discrimination from surrounding communities. Despite, despite these obstacles, she worked hard to earn the best education she could and traveled far to connect with like-minded people. Rather than choosing a topic that could lead to a poor comparison to applicants like this, we ask our students to focus on anecdotes that highlight their work ethic, leadership skills, ability to connect with others, and openness to new activities. Okay, rethinking your approach to activities. Admissions offices and officers notice when you're humble. And they'll definitely note if, if your tone feels privileged. Your activities list may include traveling abroad for activities, and there's nothing wrong with that. But remember to also emphasize leadership roles, um, elaborate on creative problem solving, um, and explain how you included the larger community in your activities. Consider how you used your resources to help others. Honesty, describe your activities with honesty. Colleges can tell if students are exaggerating their accomplishments, whether through unlikely hours listed for activities or descriptions of great achievements with no quantifiable evidence. Remember, it's not always the breadth of activity that matters, but the significance. If you tutored one to two students, your profound impact on them is just as important as how broadly effective your activities may have been. And that's true for your families. I think uh, that report from Harvard said that we need to rethink how we engage. You know, if, if you are the, the, the older brother of three younger siblings, you probably have leadership skills that have gone unnoticed, or you have probably had, you've probably cared for people that you, you, you might not think is uh, noteworthy on your application. But to, an, to a reader, um, if you reflect, um, if you reflect uh, on those experiences, you'll probably come up with attributes of a leader that you can talk about on your application. So stay focused on your passions, right? If you've had many opportunities to experience the world, that is fantastic. A lot of our students travel the world over the summer. When writing your essay, or preparing for an interview, highlight your passion. For instance, one student I advised had traveled extensively. Rather than focus on that, which would clearly show privilege in the college admissions, we emphasize 
We emphasize her love for architecture and how she was able to develop that passion through experiencing different architectural styles around the world. So um, things to be uh, aware of um, when you write your essays or when you craft your applications. Uh, and finally, I guess I'm faster than I thought. Uh, so the world is always changing. And um, we are, uh, there was a, April Ryan is a thought leader, psychologist, organizational psychologist. And she recently came up with this term, are you fluxy? Uh, are you thriving in a time of unprecedented change and uncertainty? This uh, change is a constant. It's a constant in admissions. And um, we want you to be able to uh, evolve with that and be nimble around changes that happen. Um, and so uh, I invite you to watch this talk. Um, I won't show it now because it's, it's long. Um, but uh, this, this presentation is full of resources that you can read on your own. Um, hopefully it has sparked some reflection and some questions and curiosity. Um, we've covered a lot. <laughs> I think I could probably do a whole nother presentation um, around the Turning the Tide uh, reports, um, but I think that's actually it. Yes, so let's take any questions you have. There is no poor question. If you have a question, you can just unmute yourself, or if you'd like to take yourself off the video, that's fine too. Um, I believe I might have to stop sharing for a second. Yes, there we go. Any questions? There's got to be some questions. Comments, suggestions, ideas. Okay. Okay, well, that's it. Um, thanks for coming. And um, yeah.